As you grab your Bibles and open to Mark chapter uh, 1, the end of my freshman year in high school was, was literally one of the best times of my life. Most people hate their freshman year. I, I loved my freshman year of high school, especially at the end. My friends and I were all 14. We had one friend who was 17, and so she would drive us around everywhere we wanted to go, like Huntington Beach, to the movies, to Long Beach, to L.A., to Hollywood. And we didn't drink alcohol either, and so we kind of made our own fun, and so we thought this would be a great idea, completely um, not affected by alcohol at all. We said, you know, this, this would be a great idea. Let's grab a dinky flashlight, and let's go explore the drainage ditch around the corner, you know? A drainage ditch, about five foot high pipe that we would just take our little, you know, flashlight and walk down. Now, that was... Um, Nothing really crazy happened, you know, but it was, it was kind of fun, you know, a group of five, four or five of us. One guy was like, I'm too afraid, so he stayed back. So the rest of us, we kind of got together and we started trekking down this pipe. It was dirty. It smelled horrible. There was this little stream of God only knows what that water is and you didn't want to step on it because when you did, it would splash on everybody and we'd get all mad at each other. But so here we are walking down this, this huge pipe, this huge concrete pipe underground and as we're taking steps farther and farther away from the entrance, it's getting darker and darker and darker. And we're realizing just how dinky this flashlight is. This flashlight's not, not going to cut it. We're still trying. And, and as we're getting farther and farther down the tube, we're getting closer and closer to each other. And we're starting to freak out a little bit. And as we, we're, we're going down the tube, we're, we're shining our little flashlight. And we see there's this little opening at the top of the pipe. And as we get closer, we, we see a little ladder. We realize it's a manhole. And so we're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. So we're, we're getting closer. But as we're getting closer, we're hearing these, these squeaks. And we're getting a little closer to that manhole and the squeaks are starting to increase in, in volume. And, and so we're, 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 we're all huddled together and it's getting darker. I'm like, what's going on here? We're kind of freaked out. And we, we get to this manhole. And so here we are, we're, we're, we're facing forward for the most part, but we got to the manhole and we, we, we turned the flashlight up and, and, and around the ring of this manhole were a massive amount of bats. So it's 14, we did what any, you know, self-respecting 14-year-old would do. We screamed bloody murder, and we started running out. And when we did that, what, what, what would that do for a bat? It caused the bats to leave and start flying, flapping. So we've got these things flapping all over our ears, and we're screaming because we think they're going to bite us, and we're going to turn into zombies. And so we're running as fast as we can out. And I want you to picture this. So we're screaming, and my friend, you know, it's the end. You know, he's going, like, what in the world's going on down there? Like, I'm, I was right to stay out here. And so we're, 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 we're screaming, and we're running, and we're seeing him. He's, like, really small, and we're getting closer. And as, and as we're getting closer to him, the, the darkness is, is pushing away. The light is becoming more and more obvious until we're outside with him. We're in the sunlight. We're safe. The, the bats fly away, and we're good to go. And that's an illustration of what's been happening in the book of Mark. In Mark, Mark begins in chapter 1, verse 1. In kind of darkness, nobody knows who this Jesus is. Now, the readers know, chapter 1, verse 1, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So we know who he is, but no one else in the story knows who he is. He's an enigma. Who is this guy? And really, that's the entire book of Mark. The entire book of Mark is answering the question, seeking to answer the question at least, who is this man? Who is Jesus? Well, the beginning of the book says he's the Christ. This word, the, the, the word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a, it's a title. It's a, it's a Greek translation of a Jewish word, which means Messiah, which in the Old Testament means basically God's king, the, the, the king who would come and rescue the Jews from their oppression and would set up God's kingdom on earth and establish peace on earth. That's the, the Christ, the Messiah. And then he's also called the Son of God, which, which is not biological. It's another title, which means that Jesus is God, just like I am what my parents are. So Jesus is what God is, and this title, Son of God, means that he is equal with God. And here's the interesting thing about Mark, is that no human being in the book of Mark calls Jesus the Christ. Not one. From chapter 1, verse 2, to chapter 8, verse 28, nobody identifies Jesus as the Christ. The entire population of Galilee, thousands and thousands of people, are in the dark about who Jesus is, even his disciples. Remember, his disciples are not coming across like really strong, capable, godly men. They're coming across as kind of weak. 
They're coming, and it's only going to get worse from here. They're coming across as hard, hard-hearted. They don't understand what's going on. In chapter 4, verse 41, they even proclaim the, the message, who is this guy? We don't even know who he is. Well, the religious leaders have an answer to that question. The religious leaders say, well, he's demon-possessed, and his family has an answer. Chapter 3, verse 21, he's crazy. So the true identity of Jesus has been shrouded in darkness in Mark until the event we get to today. Every event in Mark, the darkness has been decreasing and the the light has been increasing. So turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Peter's confession, which is what our passage is classically called, is the sunlight of safety and truth. So let's look at it, this, this, this ray of light in the midst of darkness. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Remember, these are the words of God. Mark 8, 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? This is, that's the question for the whole book of Mark. Who is this guy? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So the question all of Mark is asking is, who is Jesus? The answer after eight and a half chapters of Mark is, you are the Christ. This is the high point of Mark, which means everything in the book of Mark has been leading up to this, to to verse 29. The whole book has been leading up to that verse. And then from this moment on, everything changes. The whole book of Mark starts to take a sinister tone, starts to take a dark tone as we realize, starting actually in the next passage we'll look at next week, that this Christ, this King, came to die. That has been hidden completely, practically, in the previous part of Mark. All of that's going to become very clear starting after chapter 8, verse 29. So this is really the high point. And you might be tempted to think, well, Peter, you know, he got to see Jesus do miracles and he got to see all of the sermon, hear all of that, saw the authority, saw the stuff he did. So of course he's going to say that he's the Messiah. And if you thought that, you would be wrong. Because I, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew also talks about this event. Matthew chapter 16. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, it's one book to the left. Matthew chapter 16. We'll be in verse 13. How did Peter know who Jesus really was? How did he correctly identify Jesus? Matthew was an eyewitness to this event. He was there. So he fills in some details that Mark doesn't, that Mark kind of leaves out. He writes about this event too, and it's going to sound very familiar, except that in Mark, Mark doesn't give Jesus a reaction. Here, Matthew tells us, here's how Jesus responded to what Peter said. So follow along, chapter 16, verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people People say that the Son of Man is. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now watch Jesus' response. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, which means son of Jonah, for flesh and blood, human beings, even you yourself, has not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven, parentheses, he revealed this to you. So how did Peter come to the conclusion he came to? The answer is grace. That info came out of Peter's mouth, but how did it get in his head? No, nothing human. He, Peter, or, 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 Jesus says it right here. No flesh and blood, no human being, not even you. You didn't put this in your mind. This isn't a result of you being a very uh, keen observer of what I've been doing. This isn't a result of all of the things you've heard me do or seen me do. That's not what this is. The info that was put into Peter's head that came out of his mouth was a gift of grace. You are the Christ. Now turn back to Mark chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 27 to 30 of of the book of Mark is all about knowing the real Jesus. If your knowledge of Jesus matches what Peter said, matches Peter's knowledge of Jesus, then the first thing you need to realize is that you don't know him because you're smarter, because you're nicer, because you're better than the people that don't know him. Christians, we somehow have a way of turning our knowledge of Jesus into a reason to look down on people who don't have the knowledge of Jesus. 
when we forget that the reason we even know Jesus, the reason that he even, his, his name even resonates in your ears, let alone you believe in him with all of your heart, is a gift of grace. The most fundamental thing about your knowledge of Jesus is that the only reason you know him is because God has been kind, compassionate, gracious to you. The only difference between you and people who don't know Jesus is grace. That's the only difference. That's it. Nothing else. Now, the idea that Jesus is the Christ might seem obvious to most of you, but it, but it isn't obvious to everyone. The difference between you and those who don't see Jesus this way becomes apparent because for some, the question of knowing Jesus' true identity is completely absurd. Knowing the real Jesus is a laughable idea. It's like, uh, you know, uh, because many in our culture would say Jesus didn't even exist. He's a figment of religious imagination. Asking who's the real Jesus is like asking uh, who's the real Luke Skywalker. Like, really? Come on. You know, he, Jesus, he's just a hero no different than Superman, who is an otherworldly visitor who had supernatural powers who came here to save us. And so we'd laugh if someone was like, hey, who's the real Superman or who's the real Luke Skywalker? We'd laugh at that. And they would go, and in the same way, you should laugh at people who say, you know, who's the real Jesus? What's this Jesus all about? It doesn't, it doesn't even matter. It's a foolish question. And if that's you, first of all, I'm so glad you're here this morning. That you would even come here and sit through this? That's, that's, that, that's incredible. And, and I'm going to try to answer that objection in a minute because this whole passage is really about who is Jesus. But I just want you to see, I hope that you see that, that we're, we're following Jesus not because it makes us feel good or because we grew up with it, but following Jesus because we, we actually think that what he said and did is, is true. It matches the way the world is. And if you've heard this objection and you're kind of like, well, I, I've heard it, but I don't really know how to answer it. Well, I'm glad you're here too. So I just want to help you with this a little bit. This is one of my professors here. His name is Gary Habermas. I, I took him in grad school, and he wrote a book called The Historical Jesus, which again, somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus, like, ha ha, historical Jesus. You know, there is no Jesus of history. But notice that the subtitle up there, it says the, the ancient evidence for the life of Christ. Ancient evidence for the life of Christ. So in our culture, see, in other cultures, we may be able to just start out with the fact Jesus is real, he's the Messiah, you know, everybody loves him. In our culture, we increasingly can't do that. So we kind of have to start with, okay, did Jesus even exist? And in that book, chapter 9 of that book, he examines 17 non-Christian documents. Did you hear that? Non-Christian. So we're not talking about people who worship Jesus in the first century. We're not talking about people that thought Jesus was a great guy. We're talking about enemies of Christianity, many of them, who in their writings with various people described Jesus, talked about him as a historical person. And we put those 17 documents together like he did you would find that if we had no New Testament, here's some of the things we would know about him. This is like a multiple chapter book, and there's all kinds of things, but a summary of what we would know about Jesus from non-Christian sources is this, that Jesus lived in a real place, Palestine. He had siblings. He traveled around Palestine as a teacher. He had followers from both Jews and non-Jews, and some of them thought he was the Messiah. The religious leaders, it continues, the religious leaders of his day accused him of leading Israel astray and, and, uh, and considered him a heretic. He was persecuted. And as a result of his teachings, he was actually put to death by crucifixion under a governor named Pontius Pilate. That is, that's just a small fraction, but what I want you to hear from that is what that means is that this is a real person. We're not talking about a figment of religious imagination. We are talking about a real man. Dr. Habermas, he says, quote, few ancient figures can boast the same amount of material as Jesus can, demonstrating for our purposes that there's no doubt scholarly that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. So that Jesus was a real person is a critical assumption behind the biography Mark wrote. But because a lot of people don't like what Jesus has to say about various things, one of, their, one of their tactics in that is, oh, he didn't exist. Well, prove it. Prove he didn't exist. Well, I would take the Bible as historically reliable, but many people wouldn't. So that's where I went, well, you know, let's look at non-Christian sources from the first century. What do they say? Well, summarizing, Jesus is a real person. And if he's a real person, which we just saw, then asking who is the real Jesus is not laughable. It makes sense, particularly with how much he impacted the world with his very short life. And because Jesus is a real, per is a real person, knowing the real Jesus, which is Mark's goal, 
is such a worthwhile enterprise, enterprise that every single person should wrestle with that question. The people of Jesus' day wrestled with that question. Look at verse 27. They wrestled with the question, who is Jesus? And here was their conclusion. Verse 27, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others one of the prophets. Public opinion was mixed on who Jesus really was, but we can say this for sure. Whoever someone thought Jesus was, at least when it comes to the people that, that the disciples talk about, every option the disciples talked about were that Jesus is an extraordinary person. John the Baptist was a very extremely popular person in those days. Elijah was, was there's probably no one in the Old Testament that people in the first century, particularly Jewish people, were more fascinated by than Elijah because the last book of the Old Testament said that Elijah's going to come back. And when he comes back, like he's going to wrap, like things are going to wrap up with history. So they were extremely interested in Elijah coming back. And as an aside, Jesus said that John the Baptist is like Elijah. He is the Elijah that Malachi talked about because he was the announcer of the coming of Jesus. And so they were extremely interested in Elijah in the first century. And one of the prophets, like prophets spoke for God. So when they said that you're a prophet like John the Baptist or you're a prophet like Elijah or one of the other prophets, what they're saying is your message comes from God. You are a significant person. Now each of these conclusions are very nice of Jesus and each of these conclusions are actually wrong. They're very complimentary, but they're inadequate. They don't go far enough because what all of those options do that you have in your Bible there is they, they treat Jesus with old categories. They put him into a category that is, that, that's not accurate. They, it even treats him like a mere man when he's far more than a mere man. It, it denies his uniqueness. So what this shows us is that grace makes a significant difference. Apart from grace, we have to admit, point number one, most people are wrong about Jesus. Apart from grace, we have to admit that most people are wrong about Jesus. And here's the thing, I know that talking about right and wrong with religion is kind of like offensive and non-PC in our day, and I'll get to that in a minute. But left to ourselves, we don't come to the right conclusion about who Jesus really is. And today is no different. Public opinion is still mixed on G who Jesus really is. But a, a majority of people don't agree. There are differences among all kinds of people, like, like uh, Muslims, for instance. They say that Jesus is a really great guy. He's a prophet, just like others that came before him and one that came after him. Jews consider him a heretic. The Dalai Lama said of Jesus, quote, um, he is a spiritually mature, good, and warm-hearted person. He's a model of all of those things. Deepak Chopra, if you don't know him, he's a popularizer of Hinduism in this country. He believes that Jesus was a mere man who realized what he calls the, the Christ consciousness. And what the Christ consciousness is, it's the realization that all distinctions are an illusion, that all is God and God is all. And if all is God and God is all, you're part of the all, which means that you are what? You're divine. And so he's a, he's, Deepak Chopra says Jesus is a mere man who realizes his divinity, and you should too. Mormons, for instance, they teach that Jesus is the Christ, but he's the, the older brother of Lucifer, who was a mere man who sinned, but through his obedience became a god, became one of the gods of this planet. For the scholars who are interviewed on the History Channel during Christmas and Easter, they make a distinction between the Christ of history, the Jesus of history, and the Christ of faith. They say those are two different things. They say that the, the Christ of history, which is what that book that I showed you is kind of writing against, the Christ of history, they say was, quote, a politically correct social critic, a mystic with a message of love who was so great. So here he's, he's kind of a social critic. He's kind of like a, a you know, he's, he's, you know, writes editorial, you know, pages in the Wall Street Journal. Like, this is what he did, like, publicly as a, a social critic in the first century. He's critiquing everything everything going on, but he had a message of love, and, you know, he actually died for it, so he's kind of a martyr for that, but he didn't rise again. All of that stuff was created by people who were just so broken over the fact that they lost their friend and teacher, so they kind of created a deity in the Christ of faith, so there's a difference. For Christians, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of God, and so on and on and on and on and on of all these opinions. Now, here's the thing. We can't all be right. You know why? Because we disagree. 
Because there's significant dif- differences. There's contradictions. And often people think, well, disagreement means there are no right answers. But that doesn't make any sense either, right? There was a day when people disagreed on the shape of the earth, right? But does that mean the earth had no shape? Reality doesn't wait for us to say, okay, what do you believe now reality changes? Like reality is fixed and either our knowledge of reality matches that reality or it doesn't. And that's the same issue here. Either Jesus is the Christ or he's not. There's no middle ground. In other words, if Jesus is a real person, then he's not whoever we think he is and he's not whoever we want him to be. He's a specific person, just like you're a specific person, just like I'm a specific person. If you say, I know John Benzinger, you describe me as a seven foot tall Eskimo, you got the wrong guy, you know? I mean, put it differently, there are lots of Jesuses out there, just like there are lots of cities in America called Phoenix, actually seven of them. So how do I identify one from the other? They all have the same name, like are they all the same place? Or we go, absolutely not. We describe one specifically, the way we describe it will distinguish it from others. So we say, the phoenix in Arizona is not the one in Illinois or Louisiana or Maryland or Michigan or New York or Oregon. There's only one Jesus, like there's only one phoenix, Arizona. But if you drive east, you know, on the 60 and just keep driving, like you're never going to get to that phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona is a specific place, which implies that there are a bunch of things that it's not, meaning... If your phoenix is surrounded by cornfields, you got the wrong place. What if you're like, well, my phoenix has 140 people instead of 1.4 million. Sorry, you got the wrong place. Well, you know, my phoenix is on the east coast. Okay, that's not Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, well, my phoenix is on the west coast. That's not Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, well, my phoenix, you know, it snows there. Sorry, you got the wrong place. You see what we're doing? There are numerous Jesuses out there, just like there are numerous cities called Phoenix. How do we know one from the other? We describe them, and as we describe them, our descriptions either match reality or they don't. So if Jesus is a real person, then he's a specific person, just like you are. And if he's a specific person, then there are lots of ways that describe him that are false, just like there are lots of ways to describe you that are false. And they're false when how he's described does not match who he really is, just like when you are described in a way you really aren't, that description is false as well. And I know it's so not PC, like I said before, to talk about true and false, right and wrong when it comes to religion, but technically we're not talking about religion. Technically we're talking about a person, Jesus of Nazareth. And you either know the real Jesus or you know a not real Jesus, a fake Jesus, a Jesus that doesn't exist. Now Jesus was not happy with public opinion. Look back at verse 29. Jesus is really asking the first question to get to the second question. And Peter, on behalf of the 12, steps up, verse 29. Who do you say that? Notice that word, but. What he's saying there is, I'm expecting a different answer. But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Now, when Peter says this, it's been about 12 to 18 months that he's been walking with Jesus. And this, Jesus asked this central question. And notice, these two questions force him to come to a conclusion. These two questions are, are he's like, I don't want you to affirm the public, public opinion. I want you to tell me who do you think I am? And now, easy to say Peter's, you know, caught up in the moment, you know, he's, you know, he, he was put on the horns of dilemma and he didn't want to look bad. So he says his own, you know, he says, you know, you and you alone are the Christ. But nothing in front of him would have prepared him to say that. And I want you to think about this for a minute. He said this when Jesus is not sitting on a throne, high and exalted, with all the world looking to him and worshiping him and saying, you're awesome, you're great. He says this when Jesus is poor and powerless and hated. When the religious people of his day, like the religious leaders who were the most powerful people in, 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 the, in the world at the time for those Jewish people, when the Jewish people were dominated by the religious leaders and the religious opinion of Jesus, as well as the political opinion of Jesus, is he's a problem, he's a heretic, and we need to get rid of him. He says this in this moment when it would, when it would have been so easy with what's around him for him to say, uh, I don't know. And there's nothing in Peter's background that would have led him to this conclusion either. I mean, remember, the 12 are depicted as hard-hearted, they're depicted as slow to learn. And think about it. If you're, if you're Peter, 
You grew up going to Sabbath school, Saturday school, at the synagogue. Like, here you are. And this, this whole time you've been told, like, when the Messiah comes, he's going to destroy the Roman Empire, and he's going to set up his kingdom, and he's going to reign over the world. And here's Jesus in front of you, and he doesn't look like a king. He doesn't look like anything that you thought in your mind. Like, this, just, this wasn't one of those things that maybe the synagogue leaders brought up, like, once a week. This was, or, or, you know, once a year, you know, or once every decade. Like, they talked about the Messiah every week because they were oppressed by the Romans, and they're going, God, send your Messiah, rescue us, free us. So they're, they're singing songs about the Messiah. They're hearing sermons about the Messiah. And then this Jesus guy shows up. And there's no category for Peter to look at this and go, uh, yeah. And not only that, but like I said, all the religious leaders hated Jesus. So here's this untaught common fisherman makes this proclamation, not a religious scholar, not in Jerusalem, but a place called Caesarea Philippi, which we'll look at in a minute. That is a huge step for Peter to take. That is not a minor thing for him to say in his, with his culture and his background. And notice verse 27. They are in a place called Caesarea Philippi. This is about 25 miles north of where Jesus, his hub of, of movement, which is called Galilee. But what I want you to hear is that it's 25 miles north of Jewish people. So Peter is not making this surrounded by other Jews who are all like, Jesus is awesome. And then here's Peter who's like, you're the Messiah. And everyone's like cheering. They're surrounded by non-Jewish people, all of which Caesarea Philippi is a place which was, is a famous center for idolatry in the first century. So here they are in this completely non-Jewish world. Of, of, of idol worshipers who were sacrificing animals and, and to, to the god Pan because they believed that in this city there's this cave, which you could go to today, where that's where this god Pan was born. So they would come and they'd sacrifice animals and they'd worship here in Caesarea Philippi. And here in this Mecca of worship to a false god, Peter proclaims, you are the Christ. In other words, to say that was very bold for Peter. Jesus puts him on the horns of a dilemma, and he says this, either you're going to say right now what you know by grace, or you're just going to try to fit in. You're just going to conform. Peter, what's it going to be? And really, he asked them, so it's not just Peter, it's you disciples. What's it going to be? The same is true today. For those which are many of us, if not most of us, or all of us who suffer from the disease of non rockabotus Have you heard of that disease before? non rockabotus We want to rock the boat. We're afraid of what people are going to think about us. For all of us, we suffer from that to one degree or another. We need to realize the real Jesus is risky. The real Jesus is risky. It was risky for Peter to make this proclamation. Mark's biography of Jesus called a gospel is a succession of challenges every week, challenge to make up your mind. To make, he, Mark is making it clear, this is who Jesus is for you to look at him and go, am I going to give my life to you and follow you or not? Jesus doesn't allow us to remain neutral. He even says, Matthew 12, 30, whoever is not with me is what? Against me. And that whoever means me in you. I said earlier that each of us must wrestle with his question, who is Jesus? And since Jesus is a specific person, like I said before, there is a right or wrong answer to that question. Jesus either is the Christ, he is the Messiah, he's the one foretold in the Old Testament, he's the one who will someday um, rescue Israel from her enemies, which she still has enemies today. You've noticed that right in the news. She still has enemies. And he will set up his kingdom and establish peace in the earth as he reigns over it as, his, as our earth's rightful and powerful king. Either he is all of that or he is not all of that. There's no middle ground. And so here's the risk. I've kind of tried to like show you the risk in this. Let's say Christians are wrong. Let's say for the sake of argument, Christians are wrong. That Jesus, they believe Jesus is the Christ, but he's really not. Their, 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 their belief in him doesn't match reality. Well, if you agree with that statement, I agree that he's not the Christ. If you agree with that statement, well, then you've, you've really lost nothing, right? You're right. So here you go. You know, you were right. He wasn't the Christ. And if I, if I disagree with that question, if I'm a Christian, here's the risk. What I'm risking is, well, I could have done more stuff in my life. I could have had more fun. I could have, you know, done more things. I could have done stuff the Bible says not to. I could have not done stuff the Bible says not to. Like, I could have just had more fun in my life. But, and so that's the risk. The risk is, well, he might not be the Christ if I agree with that. Well, 
You know, my life is kind of, you know, not as fun as it could be, but here's the thing. If he's not the Christ, then when you die, you disappear, and so what's the big deal, ultimately? Right? Die, you disappear like everyone else. He's not the Christ. It's all a big hoax. Okay. That's the risk. Well, now let's say Christians are right. They believe that Jesus is the Christ, and he actually is. Well, here's the risk. If he is the Christ, and I think he is, then I've gained a lot, haven't I? Sins forgiven, eternal conscious bliss in a world that never ends, where every second is better than the last, and joy is ever-increasing, fun is ever-increasing, love is ever-increasing for all of eternity. It's not bad. One of Jesus' cousins, his name is John, and he wrote a book of the Bible in a book called 1 John, apt name, in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, quote, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, which means whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is a child of God, is a, is a, is a son and daughter of God, is connected to God in relationship that lasts forever. Well, if he's the Christ and I disagree with that, then I've lost a lot, haven't I? That's the risk. That's the risk, isn't it? Same guy, 1 John chapter 2, same book, 1 John chapter 2, verses 22 and 23 says this, Who is the liar but the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. In other words, I cannot have a relationship with God apart from Jesus, and I cannot have a relationship with Jesus unless I affirm that he's the Christ, he's the Messiah, he's the King. So you see the risk there? You know, Jesus is risky. He's very risky. And if I'm wrong about him, he, he's very risky if I'm wrong about him, but he's also very risky if I'm right about him. And the reason is because the word Christ means king. What it means is that if I affirm that Jesus is the Christ, what it means is that he's in charge of me. He gets to tell me what to do. He's my master. He's my authority. And, and oh, the modern mind hates that idea that someone's going to tell me what to do. I did it my way. So he's risky because like Peter, what we see in him, agreeing that Jesus is the Christ calls each of us to go against the grain. It calls each of us to do things that even on the inside we go, should I really do that? That, seems, that doesn't seem right, but I mean the Bible says it, so I've got to do it. The Bible says it, I should believe it. It causes you to go against the grain. So there's a risk there to stand out, to be different. There are risky implications on both sides of the answer of who is Jesus. The issue is, as you look at that list up there, does the benefit outweigh the cost of saying no? That's really the question, right? Does the benefit of saying, yes, Jesus is the Christ, outweigh the cost of saying no? looking at it very logically, looking at it very like matter-of-factly. You can disagree with Peter and John, and the risk is separation from God, punished forever for your sins. You can agree with Peter and risk all the implications that Jesus being your king has. There's no middle ground. Eventually, each of us has to decide which risk is more worth it to us. Now, after making a decision like that, after making a proclamation like that, here's Peter, and he's like, you're the Christ, and like, you're, you're the fulfillment of the Old Testament, you're, you're what everyone is longing for. Every time someone goes to the synagogue, they're like, the Messiah, God sent your Messiah, fasting, praying, Messiah, Messiah. Well, you're that guy, and you would think, okay, great, well, let's tell the world. Let's like, let everybody know. Well, look at verse 30. Jesus puts a stop to that. He goes, and, and he strictly charged them to tell everyone about him. Is that what it says? Is that what it says in your Bible? It doesn't say that in my Bible. It says, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. The implication of Jesus telling them not to tell anyone about him is that Jesus accepts what Peter said about him. When he, when he says, okay, you got me right, but you can't tell anybody yet. And this word strictly charged is an incredible word. This is a word that Mark uses to describe the way Jesus talks to demons strictly charging them. Why would he react like that? Think about like, what? Like, why would you react like that, Jesus? Why doesn't he want anyone to know what Peter knows? The answer is that Peter knows that Jesus is the Christ, but he doesn't know everything that that means. 
That there is, there's true information in his mind, but there's not enough information in his mind. And how do I know that? Notice what happens next. Verse 31, which we'll look at next week. And he began to teach them, saying that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. The first time in this book that it talks about the death of Jesus right here. So like I said, after verse 29, this whole book changes. And it's now getting us ready for what we all know happens as readers of this book is that Jesus is going to die. They don't know this at this point. So, here's, so, so here is, uh, here's Jesus saying this, I'm going to die and rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Another word Mark uses of Jesus talking to demons, here's Peter talking to Jesus. You're the king of the world, and now I'm rebuking you. I mean, talk about going from like the best of times to the worst of times in the same conversation. Guys, you know what that's like with your wives. And so, but... Notice he says, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. The bottom line is this. Jesus steps them, steps in and stops them from telling them, telling people that he is the Messiah because people would misunderstand what that would mean unless they understand the death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, guess what? This prohibition in verse 30 doesn't stand anymore. Why? Because the death and resurrection of Jesus already happened. Which means what Jesus says here has been uh, overturned by what he says to his disciples after the resurrection when he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. In other words, once grace has visited you and you have accepted the risk and you said, all right, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm gonna, you, you, I, I think you're the Christ, and, and what that means is you're in charge, and that means you're in charge of me. Well, that truth will transform your life and for the better, and so much so that you can't stay silent about it. The way I put it for point number three, embrace the truth that saved people save more people. Unlike Peter, we know what it means that Jesus is the Christ. We know that he's not just the reigning king, but before he's the reigning king, he's the, the suffering servant. Jesus, think about this. Jesus caught his disciples, you know, using a fishing metaphor. Here they are fishing. He catches his disciples, and then what does he say to them? I'm going to make you fishers of men. In other words, caught fish, fish for more fish. Found people, find people. Saved people, save more people. The message is supposed to spread. If you liked our Facebook page, you know that on Friday, I, I said that the next five weeks, so this Sunday and the next four weeks, are, will be great messages to bring someone from your circle to. Now, if you're not familiar with that, your circle is, are these five to 15 people that God has specifically placed in your life that he wants you to be a missionary to. So co-workers, your spouse maybe, a parent, a, a child, a, a neighbor, whatever. And I said, you know, these would be good messages because Jesus is really honing in on the core of Christianity through the rest of chapter 8. And so that's where we're going to be over the next four weeks. And so this might be a great time for you to invite someone from your circle. Now, if you're uncomfortable with the idea of saved people saving more people, Keep your finger here and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, it's awesome um, that you're here. 1 Corinthians is uh, about six books to the right from Mark. So if you get to Galatians or Revelation or the, the index, you've gone too far. But it's about six books to the right. It's called Corinthians because it's written to a, a group of people in a city called Corinth. And so Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is describing his kind of like, this is how I tell people about Jesus. This is what's going on in my mind. And what he says basically is this. I, I try to remove every barrier. Like the gospel is offensive enough. So I want to remove every barrier of offense so that I just have the gospel. I just have the good news of Jesus. And so verse 22, he's talking about various categories of people. And he says in verse 22, to the weak, I become weak. I, I remove every offense that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I'm, God might save some. Is that what your Bible says? 
What does your Bible say? I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. So you might read that in Sunday school superstar. Um, and you might go, well, no, God saves. We don't save anybody. Well, here's Paul, here's Paul number one missionary, probably number one Christian who ever lived, going, um, I, I save people. So it had, got me asking the question, you know, like, how does he save people? How, does he, how do we save people? And I'd argue we save people the same way uh, that, that you throwing a drowning person, a life preserver, saves him. You don't actually grab that guy and, and bring him to shore, grab him and pull him to safety. You throw him the life preserver, and then it's kind of up to him to, to grab the life preserver and, you know, get to safety. And when that person meets you and says, you saved me, I mean, it's true, but technically the life preserver saved him. You were just the means to getting the life preserver to that person. In the same way, you tell people about Jesus. Jesus saves them. But you are the means that God used to get Jesus to them. So in a sense, you saved them too. Philosophically, it'd be like uh, uh, the primary cause of salvation is God, but a secondary cause would be you giving the message to another person, maybe in your circle, outside your circle, whatever. Now, if saved people save more people, who are the people in your circle? You should be praying and asking God to show you that if you don't know and praying that God would open, give, give you an opportunity to talk to them. But if you're like most of us, we're kind of scared to do that. And I had a, a meeting with a guy this week who just said, you know, I, I heard you talking about evangelism once, and could you just help me with that? I just, I, I'm, I, you know, I get kind of afraid, and so, you know, what do I, what should I do with that? And I thought, since this passage ends on a note of evangelism, he says, don't tell anybody about this, but that's been superseded by going to all the world and make disciples. I thought, well, maybe if I give you some tips on evangelism, the same things I gave this guy except not as well organized as you're going to have right now. Um, I maybe thought this would be helpful. So I call these the eight B's of evangelism. And the first one is be calm. As I'm talking to this guy, there's no particular order here. There might be more. This isn't like refined. Um, this is me trying to like summarize my conversation in a way that would, would, would communicate for all of you. And so one of the things that comes up when it comes to evangelism is, uh, you know, like, well, what do I do if they ask a question? Like, I, I don't, I wouldn't know what to say. And I'm, you know, I, I get kind of freaked out. And, you know, I'm, I'm and so, so what do I do? And, and, and my response to him was, don't make this any harder than it is. Here's the thing. If you know enough to be saved, if you, if you know enough to have a relationship with God, then you know enough to help someone else have a relationship with God too, right? If you know that God is, you know, God is, God exists and that we've, We've sinned against him, and he sent Jesus to punish him instead of us, so give your life to Jesus. Like, if you know enough to be saved, then you know enough to help someone else be saved, too, so you can be calm. Second, be trusting. Trust that God is with you. I mean, when we're afraid, what we're really saying is, God, I can't trust you. And so trust that he's with you. Trust that he's in you. Trust that he will work through you. Trust him. Number three, be realistic. I, I mean, I used to think, as, as most Christians do, that if a person doesn't get saved when I share the gospel with them, then it was a waste of time. And my response is, that's not true at all. If that's the case, then most of Jesus, what Jesus said was a waste of time because most of the people didn't respond. No, a good evangelistic counter, yeah, it's when someone gets saved, but a good evangelistic counter is also when you are just faithful to push through the fear, to trust God, and give them the message. Your job is not to save this person. Like, like I said, God saves this person. He uses you to do that. Your job is to just be faithful. So just be faithful. Just give the message. Leave the results in his hands. Second, third, fourth, be praying. Pray before, pray during, pray after you talk to someone about Jesus. Pray all the time. Number five, be biblical. Your words are far less powerful than God's. So quote the Bible when you can, which means that maybe you need to memorize some verses. Memorize John 3, 16. That's perfect. You know, that, you know, and you don't have to say, as the holy apostle John, cousin of Jesus, saint of the world, like said in the third chapter of his beautiful tome on the life of Jesus, verse 16. Like, you don't have to do all that stuff. Just say, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him won't perish, but have eternal life. You don't even need to say this is in the Bible. Those words are powerful because they're God's words. Number six, be yourself. Don't try to be someone you aren't. 
Being fake is obvious, especially if you're interacting with someone in your circle. They've seen you sin, so if you put on the air of, like, I'm holier than thou, then you're going to destroy your, your witnessing to them. You're talking to them about Jesus. Um, and so be yourself to, uh, another way, to, number seven, be humble. Admit your sin. It's okay if you say something stupid. Their entire salvation does not depend on you. Admit when you don't know the answer to a question. This would happen to me often when I would talk to non-Christians. They'd bring up an, uh, an objection that I'd never heard before. Now, in that moment, I could try to fumble around and say something stupid, or I could just say this. That's a really good question. I have no idea the answer to that question. I've never even thought of that question. No one's ever asked that question to me before. So do me a favor. Give me your email. I'm going to go home and study this, and I'll get back to you on that, or I'll we'll see you next week, and I'm going to spend the next week working on this. You, you know what I mean? Like you can just be humble about it. You don't have to put on the airs of like, oh, I know all this stuff. You don't have to know anything except the gospel. When someone asks a question, that's a good one. Give me your email and I'll get back to you. And then finally, number eight, be unpredictable. Here's what I mean by this. Everyone is expecting you to come across as an angry, Bible-thumping, unloving, fundamentalist, homophobic jerk. So do not give them the satisfaction of being that to them. So, for instance, when I talk to homosexual people, I, I know what they, are, they want to ask me about. I know where they want to go with this conversation. So you know where I do not go? To the homosexual question. Because they're ready for me, and they want to attack me, and they have all of their arguments and all of these things. I don't even go there. You know where I go with them? Ten Commandments. You ever stolen anything? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever, and like, you ever used God's name as a cuss word? Bummer. By your own admission, you've, you're a lying, thieving blasphemer, and when you die, you're going to stand before God on Judgment Day. Like, I'm not telling them this about you're a sinner, you're awful. Like, they just admitted it by me just going through the Ten Commandments. Is this is what God's going to judge you by? How would you do on Judgment Day? You see. Well, what happens there is that it completely diffuses their anger and it throws them off and they go, what? Oh, okay, well, I want to go here. but So this happened to me a couple weeks ago. I was on a plane. I was flying from here to Orange County. And I sat next to a girl. She's about 20, 25 years old, somewhere in there. And um, I'm, I'm sitting there going, okay, God, if you want me to talk to this girl, help me with that. And so we just start a conversation I asked her, you know, what were you doing out here? I said, do you live here? No. What were you doing out here? And she writes a blog, and she uh, traveled out here. She owns her own website, and, and so she uh, traveled out here to cover something. And she writes for, like, a libertarian blog, too, like the Frederick Papers or whatever. And so I'm talking to her, and I, and I asked her specifically, what do, you, what do you do for a living? Because I know eventually, unless she's super selfish, she's going to ask me what I do for a living. And, I mean, you don't have that benefit, but I do, to kind of get this conversation moving to the gospel. So she says, you know, I'm doing all this, and we're talking about that. Oh, that's interesting, gun laws and all that. And she's like, eventually, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a pastor. You see this, like, blank stare. Oh. And I said, yeah, don't hold that against me, okay? Just a normal guy, promise. She goes, yeah, you know, and she starts talking about her parents who are these super Christians, she says, and starts to like, you know, really make her feel judged and all that. And so from there, she feel judged because of relationships that she's had and all this stuff. And, and so um, as we're talking about that, what is she expecting from me? She's expecting that I'm going to be like her mom and dad. I'm going to jump down her throat. Hey, you should do this and not do that. You know, I'm older than you, blah, blah, blah. And so instead of doing that, my line, which I use all the time, is, has ever, anyone ever told you about church? And she goes, no, not really. Like, what's it all about? Like, like what's the, the bottom line of church? She's like, no, not really. And I said, so here's the thing. Here's what it is. We believe with all our hearts that there's a God who's real. And that this God gave us rules, and those rules are expressions of love to us. Where he says, this is the life that's best for you. Follow these rules because I love you, and everything will go well for you. And you know what we did? You know, we gave him the middle finger and said, no, nope, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm in charge, you're not. And here's the problem. Like, you get off this plane, and you walk over to an air marshal, and you give him the middle finger. Like, that's not, things aren't going to go well for you, you know? And here's the problem. We did that to God, that's bad news. Like, we're in trouble. 
She's like, uh-huh, yeah, that makes sense, you know? And so then I said, but here's what God did. Instead of saying, you know what, that's really awful for you, so I hope you figure that out, but ha you can't, so you're going to all burn in hell forever. Enjoy. Enjoy your couple decades here, and then bye-bye. Instead of doing that, he actually put on skin, came here, lived the life we would never live, died the death that we deserve, and rose again to prove it's all true. I said, so people go to church every week because they're amazed that God would do that and they want to sing to him, they want to serve him, they want to worship him, they want, they want other people to know about him because they are amazed that Jesus would do that for us. She's like, uh-huh. So what did I just do there? Like, I just gave her the gospel without saying anything about you're a sinner, and, you know, you're going to go to hell, like everything she was expecting I kind of completely undercut all of that and still got the gospel out to her so that whole thing like, you know, be, be, be biblical. Like here, like I got the gospel out. Like there be faith. Like, like here we are. Like, okay, I said the gospel. I did what I needed to do. But then she starts asking questions. Well, what about this? And what about that? So then I ended up giving her the gospel like four more times after that. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm on, you know, you can check us out on YouTube. Like here's my card. Like if I can help you with anything, here you go. Like, but, but all of that from, from saying, I'm not going to go down the road you think I'm going to go on, and I'm not, I'm not going to fall for your trap, in other words. I know the trap that you're going to set for me, and so instead of going to that, I'm going to go somewhere else. Now, I, I will admit that takes practice. I will admit that that is, you know, not the easiest thing to do all the time. But these are just eight ways, hopefully, that can help you kind of move past the... Uh, the fear and actually talk to your circle and even invite them here. A study I just read said that it takes seven invites for one person to come to your church. And so if you've only asked once, six more to go, you know, and then who knows what will happen there. But saved people save more people because the real Jesus can't be hidden. And this proclaiming the death of Jesus is what we do in communion. So before we end, we're going to take communion together.